Hello, well today I'll be talking about Tatiana Lungin's biography on Wolf Messing. That's the main feature. But first, let's hear a little violin playing from my friend Arnie Broadstock. Throughout the Cold War, the Soviet KGB began employing the use of paranormal tools and warfare to counter their enemy strategies. But to the surprise of some, interest in this field dates back to the man who banned the practice of the paranormal and persecuted those who practiced it, Joseph Stalin. Join us as Paranormal TV explores Stalin's interest and lets the truth be told on this incredible story of Wolf Messing. Located within former Soviet files on the paranormal is the dossier of Wolf Messing. Wolf Messing was a fabulous character. He started out in Germany. He then became known as probably the most famous psychic in Europe in the 20s, the 30s. There are a couple famous tests, and one kind of delicious one was he was tested by Einstein and Freud. In a historic meeting, Messing was invited to demonstrate his mental abilities. As the story goes, they were in Einstein's apartment, and he said, Okay, Dr. Freud, send me a telepathic message of what you want me to do. And he thought for a minute, and then he went into the bathroom, opened the cupboard, took out some tweezers, went back into the living room and said to Einstein, Oh, excuse me here, Professor, and plucked a hair out of his mustache. And Freud said that was exactly what he had asked him to do. Messing became quite famous for his psychic abilities. He even went so far as to predict the outbreak of war between the Soviets and the Germans, despite Stalin's infamous non-aggression treaty with the Nazis. He also predicted the end of the war to the month and the death of Germany's Führer. In light of his reputation, people began to take his predictions more seriously especially the occult-obsessed Adolf Hitler, who put a 200,000 mark bounty on Messing's head. The world-renowned psychic was forced to flee to Russia, where Joseph Stalin himself became interested in the possible military application of Messing's abilities. But first, Stalin wanted to test Messing for himself. One night when uh, Messing was performing in a little border town, they came and took him to see someone. It turned out to be Stalin. And Stalin gave him two tasks to do. One was to write, to rob a bank by psychic means. Of course, Messing had no account at the bank. His challenge was to withdraw the money using only his psychic powers of influence over the teller's mind. Messing handed him a blank sheet of paper and then mentally willed the teller to withdraw 100,000 rubles. Well, 
Well, there we have it, and that is Paranormal TV's start of a documentary on Wolf Messing. I think if you want to see the rest of it, you have to join Paranormal TV on YouTube. I don't know if there's a fee, but they can, you can find them quite easily. Now, I first encountered the name Wolf Messing when I sat in a physical circle with a female medium who allowed many spirit people to use her mediumship for direct or independent voice. And one such speaker gave his name as Wolf Messing, a man who, when on earth, had a very gravelly and distinctive voice, very coarse and probably difficult for a female to imitate. In fact, the medium concerned is such a beautiful singing voice, you couldn't, um, you, co you couldn't imagine that uh, it was one and the same person speaking. So the gravelly voice would come through and would say, Wolf Messing. Me he says more like this, wolf meshing. So it's very gravelly, a lot more gravelly than uh, my, my soft tones allowed. And uh, speaking a little bit of German, I would say to him, Guten Abend. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say to him like that. I'd say, Guten Abend, Herr Messing. And he would say, Guten Abend. That's about as far as we got though, and but I, it it made me want to um, find out more about hair messing, and so I sent off and bought Tatiana Lungin's book, edited by Hugo, the true story of Russia's greatest psychic. Now this book was the first edition of the English translation the Western world of the book, which obviously was uh, printed uh, initially in Russian. So the first edition in of the English version, 1989, and it's 180-odd pages long, quite a few photographs in the centre, black and white, and a very interesting book it is indeed. Let's take a, a read from the, the covers. Wolf Messing the True Story of Russia's Greatest Psychic by Tatiana Lungin. In this, the first biography and personal memoir of Wolf Messing to appear in the West, Tatiana Lungin limbs a revealing portrait of one of the greatest psychic performers of the 20th century. Born a Polish Jew near Warsaw, Messing ran away from home at the age of 11 and soon discovered his psychic gifts. Supporting himself by performing mind-reading acts in Berlin theatres, at 14 Messing was sold by his unscrupulous manager to the famous Bush Circus. In no time Wolf gained an international reputation as the world's greatest telepath as he toured the capitals of Europe, and in Vienna Messing met Albert Einstein, who brought him to the apartment of another admirer of his abilities, Sigmund Freud. His touring days ended abruptly in 1937, when, after Messing publicly predicted the downfall of the Third Reich, the Nazis placed a sizable bounty on his head. Summoning all his hypnotic powers, he escaped capture by the Gestapo and fled to Russia. In the USSR, Messing displays of telepathy, uncannily accurate predictions, and psychic crime solving gained him a rare celebrity status. While most parapsychologists were forced to conduct psychic research in secrecy, Messing thrilled audiences in packed theatres across the country. His fame was all the more amazing, coming as it did in the Marxist society dominated by Joseph Stalin, the man who had critically and officially abolished extrasensory perception. Even Stalin himself was intrigued by Wolf's ability to influence thoughts at a distance, 
and devised a number of unusual tests of Messing's powers. The stories of how Messing successfully took on Stalin's challenges to hypnotically elude his personal security force and even commit psychic bank robbery are colourfully related. As Messing's longtime friend and confidant, Lungin draws from personal notes, conversations with Wolf, and reports of other eyewitnesses of his performances to chronicle Messing's incredible life and career. At the same time, she provides an inside look at parapsychology and psychic research behind the Iron Curtain. And then in 1989, Tatiana Lungin was living in Los Angeles, was a former journalist in Moscow. And uh, as I said there, a close friend of Messing for over 30 years before his death in 1974. And Messing specifically charged her to prepare his life story. So, let's take a look inside the book then and uh, have a read. So we find um, uh, well, a quick potted history of, of Wolf's life from recollection of reading this book was that he lived in the Jewish part of um, a village in near Warsaw, Poland, which was controlled by Russia at the time. I'm not sure what language he was speaking then, but he, he has ended up speaking a form of German, and there is a part of Poland that spoke German at that time. So um, by the age of 11, he may or may not have had some psychic experiences. I think the book relates some, but uh, his father wanted him to become a rabbi. He didn't like that idea at all, so he ran away. He jumped on a train to Germany, and uh, his first psychic experience began on that train. The conductor came along and asked him for his ticket. Then he, he handed over a blank slip of paper, nothing on it. And mentally, he was willing the conductor to accept it as a ticket. And lo and behold, the conductor did. So he ended up in Germany. He uh, lived rough, I think, in Berlin. And I think he met with an accident and was laid unconscious, taken into a hospital. And when he came to, he had conversations with the doctor and he basically told the surgeon exactly what had happened in the operating theater when he was unconscious, like an out of body experience, I suppose. So the surgeon was incredibly impressed with this and he was the manager named on this fly sheet. And he had um, Wolf performing all kinds of psychic tri tricks. And then at some point, the surgeon unscrupulously <laughs> sold him. I don't know if you can sell somebody like that, but he basically passed him over for a fee, no doubt, mm. to the Bush Circus. And that's where Wolf Messing owned his talents. So what were his talents? By the, end of, by the time he ended up uh, doing a very large um, doing very large shows in Russia after the, probably during and after the Second World War, uh, he would basically be given a series of tasks. Here's a, a short task that somebody gave him. Uh, the person said, I like birds. Right now, I have a cage of doves. I would like Messing to approach me in the auditorium, take the key to the change to the cage from my right suit pocket, open it, pull out a white dove and carry it onto the stage. So that was the task he was given. And he would have to mentally, telep telepathically, um, I'm not sure if he was given that task on a piece of paper. I think he was. So there's the task on the piece of paper. He would then have to deduce who was the person in the audience who had the cage of doves and go up to them 
put his hand in the right suit pocket, take out the key, open the dove from the cage and carry it back onto the stage. That's a very, that's a very simple one um, by Wolf Messing's standards. And here's one that Wolf uh, gave to Tatiana, to, uh, said, this is the typical, this is something that I'm given. Uh, maybe it's not 100% typical, but uh, this is the series of instructions that he's given on a slip of paper, and then he has to carry out amongst the people in the audience. So number one, from the right side pocket of my suit, pull out a, a calendar for the year 1964. So he has to find the person and know that in the right hand side, he's got a, a pocket book. Two, open it to the month of December. So he's got to know of all the months, 12, to pick, he has to pick December. Three, underline today's date. Well, that's easy enough, but he's got to, to underline the date. Four, from the left side pocket of my suit, pull out a black packet with photographs. Five, find among the photographs a picture of a young man and woman holding a shoe brush and another picture of a young girl in a lavender dress. It's starting to get really complicated now, isn't it? And that's only point six of 12. Uh, point six, put the rest of the photographs back in the left side pocket of my suit. Seven, find the young man and woman in the fifth row and bring them on stage. Eight, from my left trouser pocket, pull out a packet of playing cards and spread them out in the following manner. A. All the aces in one pile, face side down. B. In the upper row, the Queen of Diamonds, Queen of Hearts, leave a space for the Queen of Spades, and then the Queen of Clubs. C. In the lower row, the Kings, the King of Diamonds, King of Hearts, leave a space for the King of Spades, and then the King of Clubs. Point number nine. <laughs> <laughs> You'd probably be there all night doing this list. From the left side suit pocket of the young man on stage, pull out the king of spades, and from underneath the young woman's right sleeve, the queen of spades. Ten, place the king of spades in the empty space in the row of queens. So that's the king in the row of queens. Place Eleven, place the queen of spades in the empty space in the row of kings. Twelve. Take the young man by the hand and carry out his mental command as follows. So it doesn't end. A. From the right inside breast pocket of my suit, pull out an envelope and hand it to the panel. B. Let Mr. Messing ask the panel members to unseal the envelope and, in conclusion, read all the points of the above indicated tasks. Oh, so I... I didn't read it correctly, did I? He didn't get that list of tasks in advance. The envelope was in the man that he brought onto the stage, which was one of the commands. And at that point, he then read out that list of 12 points. I don't think I could do that. <laughs> um, so uh, there he is in Germany. Uh, working for the Bosch Circus, Bosch Circus, and he's, he's be becoming quite famous as a psychic. He said he was psychic all over Europe, didn't he? So uh, he's quite famous. So the journalist in the street interviewed him and asked him to predict. And he basically, uh, he told her what was about to happen. And uh, he basically said the Third Reich, if it invades Russia, that'd be the end of it. In, in in the the end of the Nazi Party and in and the end of of Hitler, so Hitler didn't like that. Put out a massive bounty on on his head for for arrest, and he got picked up by the Gestapo, and it was a small uh, Gestapo building. He was put in a cell, and then he escaped. And how did he escape? There was about six or seven. Gestapo personnel in the whole building. 
he mentally instructed them to enter his cell, which they all did. So there's him and all the Gestapo personnel in the building. And the building was only Gestapo. And then he walked out of the cell and locked the door behind him with the Gestapo personnel inside and then walked out of the building. And there's a variety of uh, descriptions of how he supposedly then fled. But he basically thought, well, uh, Hitler's going to invade Russia at some point. Russia's going to win the war. I'd better go to Russia. So he went to Russia. And Stalin then, upon hearing about his arrival, of course, the Communist Party had banned all kinds of activity like psychic. Uh, they tried to ban religion as well, didn't they? You know, but psychics they were banning. So uh, here's um, on the back cover of this particular book, a little story from inside. And it's all about um, meeting Stalin uh, for the first time in his office in uh, Red Square. So Stalin says to Comrade Messing, you, Comrade Messing, will not be able to leave this building without this pass. Signed by my secretary, Stalin told him. This is Wolf actually relating this story in his own words. His bold assertion awoke my spirit of mischief. Without this paper, I replied defiantly. Keep it for yourself, comrade Stalin, and threaten them with the severest punishment if they dare to miss me. I finally managed to pique Stalin's curiosity. He dialed the number of the guard commander and ordered him not to let me through without an exit pass, which had to be marked with the exact hour and minute and personally signed by him, Joseph Stalin. Next, he instructed his secretary to follow 10 paces behind me without giving any indication that he was deliberately following me. I prepared myself to enter my deepest state of trance. Several minutes later, I walked right out onto the street past the guards, who remained standing at attention and looking up at the window of Stalin's study. Maybe I should blow him a kiss, I thought mockingly, when I glimpsed his figure by the window. <laughs> uh, so he became uh, officially accepted um, by Stalin and probably worked for the uh, well, he definitely worked for the for the Russian um, uh, military in the Second World War as a psychic in some form or another. Well, there's another story in the book highlighted. Well, there's quite a few actually. There's one about a German spy, suspected German spy, and there's an, another one. Uh, is that the story? I, I think it's the, the German spy is the story. Uh, that I can remember. Uh, so in in the book, so they, um, in the book, they, he relates the, the, the story of in 1944, where it begins, a suspicious looking man was arrested in 1944 near Novgorod. He was tall, blonde, broad-shouldered and wearing horn-rimmed glasses. He looked stereotypically German and immediately admitted that he was indeed German. The security officers were sure that he was an important member of Germany's intelligence service. But they had no proof. Realising that he was doomed, the Germans stubbornly insisted on his innocence. The security force tortured him and even arranged a mock execution to frighten him into confessing, but nothing worked. He was one of those rare people who can withstand great pain without cracking under it. 
security people didn't want to shoot him, they were convinced of his connection to a whole espionage network. The following was the German prisoner's version of his presence in the Soviet Union. He found himself on a Russian battlefield after suffering a severe contrusion, head injury, and made it to the nearest village, which turned out to be a to totally abandoned. He spent three months hiding in a barn, burned his uniform, put on some peasant clothing that he had discovered in a storeroom. He subsisted on food that had been left in the village cellars and sometimes shot wild game with the pistol he kept for that purpose. He didn't know a single word of Russian. This last claim sparked the officers' suspicions. They suspected that he really did know the language and could speak it fluently, but he hadn't given himself away during the entire four weeks of his confinement. At that point in the investigation, they turned to Wolf Messing. They wanted to know if the prisoner understood the conversations conducted in his presence in Russian. Wolf was asked to attend one or two of the interrogations in the guise of a high-ranking official, though he dressed in civilian clothes. He did not, however, take any part in the conversation itself. Within half an hour of the first session, during which they asked him simple questions, such as his name and date and place of birth, Messing telepathically determined that the prisoner was mentally translating everything from Russian into German when spoken to by the interpreter. Interesting. Messing knew that the prisoner was a seasoned spy. But how could his impression be proved? Within 25 minutes, Wolf came up with a brilliant plan, which he proceeded to execute that very day and which he later looked back on with much pride. His plan was so cogent that the spy fell quickly into the trap. The cross-examination in Russian was begun by the chief investigator in the presence of a secretary. Unlike the chief investigator, Meshing, befitting the role he was playing as a Soviet official, remained completely silent. He was self-controlled and calm, which is rare for someone who was carrying out such high-level orders. The suspect looked searchingly toward Messing the whole time, as if pleading for sympathy. When the routine questioning was completed, Messing tapped his finger off on the folder he carried with him and said in perfect German, Yes, I am now totally convinced that you are not guilty of anything. Then he got up from his chair, saying in the same breath, but in Russian, That's all. You are free to go. The prisoner jumped up instantly, only to realise the fatal mistake he'd made. <laughs> he tried to sit back down, but it was already too late. When Wolf first told me this story, I asked, So there are practically no criminal cases, even the most complicated, which must necessarily remain unsolved. Wouldn't it be sufficient for each government to retain a telepath or two to help with security and criminal investigations? That way, there would be neither unjust sentences nor unsolved cases. And Wolf replied, No, not so. Abilities such as mine can't serve as a panacea for crime. Every just and democratic judgment must be guided by fact. And that incident with the fascist intelligence officer was special and can't serve as an example of law enforcement agencies in general. I agreed to take part in the investigation only because the circumstances called for special measures. In fact, he was uh, undertaking a demonstration somewhere in the outback in Russia, and um, he was called upon by Stalin directly. Stalin had lost his briefcase, which contained lists of spy networks, battle plans, all kinds of very top secret material. And who did he turn to to find the briefcase? None other than Herr Meshing. So, um, all, all kinds of people turned to uh, Wolf Messing for uh, help. Uh, 
Here's another one. Not sure where to start. Uh, so there's, um, I think we'll start by, uh, in Poland, almost everyone knew the famous family of, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, I'm sorry, Z Zatoroyski. And they were all counts. Uh, besides appreciable wealth, they possessed a royal genealogy. In this fam family, a banal event occurred. A diamond brooch that had been handed down as an heirloom from one generation to the next had disappeared. Eminent jewellers estimated its value at 800,000 zlotys, which was about $200,000 in 1989. A fantastic sum for that time, not bad now. All the efforts of private detectives proved to be to no avail, and hope dwindled with every passing day. Soon the most unbelievable rumours were circulating. Count Zatarovsky flew, in, flew, to, flew to Krakow in his private plane to see me. Just at the end, oh, this is uh, Wolf um, quoting what? That. Count Zatarovsky flew to Krakow in his private plane to see me, just at the end of performances there. He was very elegant and fashionably dressed. In spite of what happened in his house, he was in a good mood. Not at all stressed. <laughs> small, small fee, no doubt. He was true. Um, he was a true mannerly or aristocrat. He told me about the brooch and urged me to help if I could. We flew back. Sorry, we flew back to Warsaw, Warsaw that day. I should stop for a moment and describe how I looked. It will bear on the events that followed. I had long, curly, blue-black hair that fell almost to my shoulders. My face was pale. I wore a black suit, a wide, loosely cut cloak, and an imposing top hat. The castle, an enormous building made from red stone and built in the old style, had two high floors with endless halls, rooms, and corridors. Each room and hall had different coloured walls and carpets, and was decorated with beautiful French furniture. A garden surrounded the castle, a fountain flowed in the middle of the park. Everything was very well taken care of. You couldn't imagine a better setting for either work or pleasure. The next morning I set about examining the evidence. Things were arranged so that everyone who lived permanently in the castle or came there every day or, or to work, passed before me. The Count readily introduced me as a fashionable artist from the capital to several people in the residence. I met his wife, a beautiful Polish woman, who was very proud of herself, and, and his daughter, who was also very attractive. I also met the maids and castle workers. Dressed in special uniforms that displayed the family insignia, they all struck me as honest and decent people. I placed everyone beyond suspicion. There remained, however, one person about whom I could not see anything definite. He was a feeble-minded little boy and a completely inoffensive creature, the son of one of the servants. No one paid any attention to him. I think we'd call him uh, someone with learning difficulties now. He had never been caught in any wrongdoing. No one suspected him at all, but it didn't seem he could appreciate the beauty or value of a diamond. He enjoyed total liberty within the castle and freely entered all the rooms. Although I couldn't pick up the boy's thoughts or moods, he made me ha apprehensive. And the feeling stuck in my mind. After some reflection, I decided to rely on my instincts. This case didn't require my sixth sense. I knew I could solve it rationally and psychologically. I remained alone with the child in the nursery, pretending to sketch in my notebook. 
pulled a gold watch out of my pocket and twirled it around on its chain. Then, as if I had remembered something, I carelessly placed it on the table and walked out. Through a window concealed behind a potted palm, I observed the little boy alone. He immediately ran over to the table, grabbed the watch, swung it on the chain as I had, and shoved it in his mouth. <laughs> well, you do, don't you? <laughs> he played with it like an ordinary toy for no less than half an hour. Then, suddenly, and with amazing agility, he leapt upon the neck of an enormous stuffed bear and opened its mouth. My gold watch glittered in his hand for a moment, then disappeared into the beast's open jaws. My instincts were right. I had not only found the thief, but his silent accomplice, the keeper of the stolen goods. Now, it was only a matter of performing an operation on the stuffed bear, and the mysterious disappearance of the diamond would be solved. When we cut the bear open, a pile of shining objects fell into our hands. There was the gold-plated teaspoons, Christmas tree ornaments, and pieces of broken coloured glass, as well as the Zachoritsky family jewel. According to our verbal agreement, I was due 25% of the total value of the found treasure. <laughs> because the total value of all things found in the bear exceeded a million zlotties. They owed me about 250,000 zlotties. 70,000 US dollars, maybe. I refused to accept this sum, but in exchange requested that the Count use his influence in the Siem, that's the Jewish, or sorry, it's the Polish uh, parliament at that time, to revoke their resolution limiting the rights of Jews. Count gave his promise, and within two weeks, the Siam abolished the statute. Wow, and the stories go on and on. So previously, there must have been story about um, them uh, missing gold spoons, etc., and possibly blaming uh, certain staff members, maybe who had access to the, to the kitchen. You, you never know. So there we are, we got a, a flavour of wolf messing. And um, take a look at the photograph. I don't know if you can see them. There he is in pondering. Look in the eyes, not, not look around the eyes, not in the eyes, look around the eyes. Well, I, you know, his hypnotism was, was different to most stage hypnotist tests you hear about in the modern world. And family pictures. Uh, that's his wife's grave. And he ended up being buried next to his wife when he died in 1974. Lovely photograph of him. And they thought those. And they're um, also uh, Tatiana Lundgren's family. That's her son and daughter-in-law there. And they they were so close. You know, the picture of Wolf with the, the grandson is actually Tatiana's grandson, not his own. Uh, here's some interesting ones. There's him working. And on the other side, that's Wolf performing healing. And did photograph. This is grave, and there's Tatiana. But he didn't really leave Russia after he uh, got there with the communists and worked for Stalin. And later on in um, uh, I'm not sure if it was the 1980s, maybe before, but possibly after Wolf Messing's passing, the, uh, the Russians did psychic spying. And the Americans heard about it and thought, well, if they're doing it, we, we've got to do it. 
where the Americans then opened up the Stargate project with people like Joe McMonagall and Inigo Jones and even um, Yuri Geller. They all worked on the Stargate project, which was the USA's equivalent of Russians psychic spying. Uh, fabulous uh, biography of the man. Absolutely incredible stories in there. Well, when I say in incredible, I do use these words incorrectly. Incre incredible means it's without credibility. So the stories are amazing. They are with credibility because they are told by the person who experienced the events and they're told by witnesses. Um, the video, do you remember the video? The uh, Wolf Messing was challenged by Stalin to rob a bank using psychic means. <laughs> what did he do? He simply walked into a Russian bank in Moscow with a blank sheet of paper and he passed the sheet of paper under the metal grill to the bank teller. The bank teller looked at it, stamped it and handed over the amount of money that Stalin demanded he steal. Say it was 150,000 rubles. Um, Wolf Messing put the rubles in his pocket or a briefcase and walked out of the bank. I don't think he said a word. It, and it's all in the book. The story's in the book. And so if you wondered how the uh, video clip ended in part two, or how it recommenced in part two of Paranormal TV's video, this is what happened. And when Stalin uh, had the bank teller presented to him with a piece of paper and asked him, why did you give Herr Messing 150,000 rubles, who didn't have a bank account uh, in that particular bank, the bank teller produced the sheet of paper <laughs> and was shocked to see that it was a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> So once I'd read the book, you can imagine my own um, curiosity was peaked. And uh, we used to go to this uh, physical seance, an hour and a quarter's drive from home. And I used to pick up two people. Well, picked up one person regularly and we picked up others later in Newport and further down the line. But on this particular occasion, the story I'm about to relate, we picked up a, a friend of mine who lived up in uh, Tree Harris, which is half an hour in the opposite direction. And she had recently lost the last of her cats and she was still working, but she was closing in on retirement. And uh, we were driving to Clevedon. Halfway through the journey, I had the thought about her cats and I said to her, you know, I've been thinking about you and cats and I've been thinking when you come to retire you're going to need your freedom and you won't want to be pinned down by having to look after a cat you know if you want to just go off on a bus trip excursion weekend away so maybe it'd be a good idea not to have any more cats and she turned to me and she said quite shocked are you reading my mind that's exactly what I was thinking at that very instant you opened your mouth. <laughs> so I think, you know, possibly that was Wolf Messing showing me by way of answering my questions. How did you do it? <laughs> how did you do this mental telepathy, Wolf? So anyway, we, we did the seance and have probably a fabulous seance. They always were. Uh, whether or not um, Wolf's voice came through that night, I doubt it. Only spoke with him a couple of times. Uh, other voices came through. As I say, there were male voices, and she, she's a beautiful singing-voiced female. And so we had the coffee and tea and cakes after the seance. Um, we we had those, and while we were um, having tea and coffee, the other lady it was a passenger in the rear of the car. Uh, we, we were talking about UFOs, and she said she'd seen a UFO, one of the big triangular vehicles that uh, 10,000 maybe people around the planet have seen, some with USA markings on it. That is an interesting one for you. And uh, she said she'd seen it. And uh, people I knew in, in Bedlinog, a nearby village to Tree Harris, where 
the other lady was from, uh, they, uh, the whole family, the whole street, had also witnessed that particular UFO, that vehicle, in, in the sky above the village. So uh, on the way home, halfway again, like the, like on the way down, I turned to the back and, well, I was looking at the front, looking at the road, uh, turning to, um, verbally to the lady behind. I, I said, I've been thinking, that story you were talking about, maybe it hit the papers. And then she quite sharply said, quite shocked, are you reading my mind? <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking when you turned and said. <laughs> So I think that was Wolf Messing teaching me, showing me practically how he actually did his mind reading. And his mind reading was so eloquently simple. He just did it. He's never trained as a hypnotist like people get trained nowadays. Uh, he did a, a lot of healing work, a lot of good. And as we heard in the one passage about finding the expensive jewellery, he turned his work to good for other people because not only did he get the staff of the Chateau Castle off the hook because they were innocent, uh, but he also uh, caused laws to be changed in Poland where they were victimizing the Jewish population. So there we have it then, uh, Wolf Messing, a biography published by Paragon House uh, in this particular version and very enjoyable read and a very enjoyable time spending in the mind of Herr Messing. Thank you very much. So let's finish our session with um, some music. Let's, let's try Arnie and his violin playing again. It's a short one, so let's have that one. Well done, Arnie. That was uh, a violin playing with a, a distinctly Polish flavour um, entitled Tree Forest Waltz. So let's uh, hear another track now on from YouTube. Uh, a friend of mine, Steve Preston, is promoting one of his older albums, and this is a song from it. Sunshine glimmering on Chesapeake Bay I watched the old money sophisticates With piloted yachts and 10 a.m. champagne Sat for a while to stare at bronze That tells me this is the landing place of Kunta Kinte it's hard to imagine that this pretty town was once a market for slaves. I seek refuge down at Chicken Roots. I need breakfast and to get out of the heat. It's a down home place where every day they say the pledge and politicians like to meet. She called me honey, I think her name was Jane And it seemed to me that in her life She may have seen more than her share of pain And I thought, you've made a place for yourself 
my friend You can't change the star But you decide the end And I thought, ooh You made a place for yourself, my friend You can't change the star But you decide the end Rushmore down to Pine Ridge and on to Wounded Knee. From the symbols of the great past, shanty towns and resentful eyes that stared at me. And when I found the place, I met a brave Sue and looked like he hadn't seen a dentist in a while. And for 20 bucks, he sold me stories of his past. With a weary practiced smile And he told me about his niece Who moved to New York To get a law degree and How a daughter speaks the language of the tribe To keep alive their history Time in the universe might not be enough for him and me. Georgia cotton fields are low It's been a wet one and the harvest didn't clear And he's working round the clock just to survive For another year He's a dying breed, he farms the land That his daddy did before The giants makes him wonder if it's worth it anymore. But every day he gets up and puts his all into the work that must be done. And every night he loves the simple things of life with his wife and son. You decide the end. You decide, decide the end. end. So there's a young wolf messing. Presumably, I'm talking over this as well. Uh, a little bit like Uri Geller, if you think about it. Both Jewish as well, both psychics. 
and uh, both very spiritual people in their own way in a different way because the psychic doesn't necessarily uh, be very religious or spiritual and the psychic is not a medium although you know the border lines are blurred so thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed my take on Tatiana Lungin's book Wolf Messing. Thank you very much. <laughs>